Hi guys, Steve, Stephen and Vince, thank you very much for joining. I'll be the host today for our, our Skyward Data podcast, uh, where we're heavily focused on mainframe, uh, data on the mainframe, mainframe modernization, and the history of the mainframe, right? We like to talk about some of the great things about the mainframe and, you know, some of the things in the, in the modern world that uh, the mainframe can do and, and folks are focused on uh, going forward. So. Um, why don't we start with introductions, Stephen, if you don't mind going first. I'll go ahead and go, uh, kind of break the ice. Hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Perva. I am the Senior Mainframe Innovation Engineer at a company called Insono. It is a managed services provider. I can talk a little bit about what I do, but that's effectively who I am. But but outside of that, I run a what I call a mainframe culture brand called Seven Nines, and I also uh, do a lot of mainframe advocacy because I'm also an IBM champion. Perfect. Perfect. Vince? Yeah, so uh, Vince Ray, and I'm uh, a CTO and one of the founders at uh, Virtual Z Computing. You know, long, long career in the mainframe going back, uh, geez, more decades than I like to admit. But uh, yeah, I've dabbled in just about every part of mainframe computing and, you know, looking forward to the discussion today. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, and Stuart, to your point, um, I spent 17 years at Accenture uh, as a consultant in the last couple of years focused on uh, mainframe modernization offerings at Accenture. Uh, and I also, also managed our global business um, with uh, IBM for about seven years. And so that's actually how I got started with the mainframe, right? And uh, our business with IBM covered everything from mainframe actually all the way to quantum computing and experimenting with quantum computing. Um, but there was a, a ton of work in modernizing in place and yeah. AO and SI and infrastructure management of, of the mainframe. And, and that's how I got started. So I'm very curious for, with you guys, right? So Vince, met, you mentioned 31 years. How did you get started with the mainframe? What, what drew you to it? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. My first mainframe experience goes way back. I mean, literally, I was in eighth grade. And the uh, school that I worked with had a you know, really early time-sharing system with uh, you know, something at the county level where we had remote access to what I later found out was a System 360 mainframe. So, yeah, I, I didn't really know that's what I was dealing with, but absolutely that was where it all started for me. You know, later on, yeah, as I went through college, I mean, I was... Um, I was one of those, I thought I was going to be something in research. You know, I did a physics degree, you know, all gung ho about it. And then I realized that my chances of doing a heck of a lot in that space were, you know, going to take a lot of years, a lot more education. Uh, you know, I stayed on in school, did my uh, master's in computer science and just found that I had a gift for writing software. And, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, in those days, I mean, this is the late 1970s. In those days, computing pretty much was mainframes. I mean, there were peripheral things off in the side, but most of serious computing, especially in businesses, were, uh, were mainframe based. So, you know, I, I did the data center thing, worked for a number of different organizations that way. Uh, worked for a couple of big defense contractors. Uh, you know, eventually, I bumped into some folks who had the idea to uh, uh, you know tackle cybersecurity, and really there were three of us. We founded a you know small startup in the in the day, and uh, out of that came the product that's you know everybody knows today as um, as Top Secret. It's marketed by Broadcom. You know, we. Um, we went from kind of nothing to about a thousand sites in three years. And uh, I guess we were so successful, we caught the attention of folks like uh, yeah, computer associates at the time who saw us as a good acquisition target. My partners took the money and ran. In my case, I, I, you know, I just had a great relationship with the uh, founders at, uh, at, at CA. One thing led to another and lots of different roles, but you know, 31 years later, I found uh, my, my career at CA coming to an end. Uh, you know, I, I thought maybe I'm too young to do the retirement thing. And uh, you know, I knew folks like 
you know, Jeannie and, you know, some of the other folks at Virtual Z, a lot of us work together one way or another at, uh, at CA. And, you know, the more we talked, the more it seemed like we all had really good ideas. And out of that came, you know, what, what the world sees today as, uh, as, as some of our products. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it it's been an interesting ride. I've learned that I'm much more at home in kind of the small, aggressive, you know, startup kind of culture where you can you know make you know a literal difference in you know just just by putting a lot of hard work into what you do. So I'm you know pretty content with what we're doing today. And you know, certainly, Mark, you've been a great addition to that. And you know, as we kind of expand our reach. You know, I'm excited about the, the the things we're doing, and it's cool to me that you know all of these years later, it's still kind of a mainframe centric world out there, and and that's what we do. Yeah, and and, and we'll get into this a little bit later. I mean, it's it's quite interesting when I tell my friends I've left Accenture and I started a Virtual Z, and they ask what Virtual Z is, and it's a mainframe software startup, and. We're not going to get into this. What is a mainframe? What is a mainframe, right? And we're we'll obviously touch on this as, as we continue. But Steve, I'd love to know your background because one of the biggest challenges, right, we see in the market is this refresh of talent, if you will, right? Um, you know, obviously a lot of the really skilled and talented people that have been out there developing amazing systems on the mainframe are, are reaching the retirement age already have. Right. Right. Um, right. And so I'd, I'd love to know how you got started with the mainframe and kind of your background as well. I think it'll. So, yeah, I, I think that, well, I'm standing in the shadow of a legend, you know, with Vince, you know, with the, the, the whole top secret story just completely makes me instantly adopt some imposter syndrome. So I so I'm going to try to try to meet up to that with just a little bit of a narrative. So so I'm probably one of the kind of the early digital natives, right? So computing was basically, it existed my whole life. So um, my dad was really into computers growing up. And well, when they came on the scene for him, he was working at a restaurant called Hardee's and he was the point of sale. He basically worked as a manager and then he got involved with, with fixing their point of sale systems. And he started bringing me along with him. He traveled a lot. And when he started bringing me along with him to do his job, it was mostly because he didn't want to fall asleep driving. He wanted someone to talk to. So he'd bring me along and I would help him out whenever I could running cables or or kind of just carrying things to and from his minivan. And this kind of inadvertently trained me in troubleshooting problems and, and just solving different different things um, and getting an interest, you know, because it was an opportunity for my father and I to, to kind of bond over something. And like many other digital natives, people in my generation, I kind of transitioned from just being this person who had kind of some tangential connection to computing to suddenly playing video games. Video games basically became an integral part of my life with like Nintendo, which I guess is 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 a little bit later than than the Atari and all the folks who who know that and the Commodore 64. But I started getting into getting into Nintendo games. And then I started playing those a lot. And then computer games became a really important thing in my life. And next thing you know, you started being able to make levels for video games. You'd be able to to kind of, I got really interested in making video games myself. So that kind of transitioned me from this person who was kind of a consumer of computing things to somebody who wanted to create experiences. And once I started doing that, my dad didn't know anything about programming, but he tried to teach me. So he would buy a book and he would bring it home and we would just work on like Visual C at the time. And we just start writing code together. He was learning while trying to teach me. And I was just a, a little youngster, didn't know anything about anything. But I got it into my head that I wanted to make these really cool experiences for people. And this was when video games were kind of a fledgling experience. And to make a long story even longer, I suppose, um, I I basically really learned about building servers and connecting them to other computers. I ran a LAN party. For those who may not know what that is, it's where you bring a bunch of computers. This was pre-high-speed internet. You'd hook them up to a local area network, and now you could play video games without a bunch of latency. So I ran that for a while, and that was kind of my 
immersion into infrastructure, which is kind of where I play mostly today in architecture. And so from there, I always knew I was going to do something with computers. And <clears throat> I, I decided that what I would do was, was try to try to just run my own business. So I ran my own business from the time I was in middle school, just doing tech support stuff. Um, and then I decided that that was good enough for me. And I told my parents, I said, you know, I'm just going to live in the basement and I'm just going to do tech support stuff. And just, this will be my life. I'm going to live in your basement forever. And they're like, well, that's really not going to fly. They're like, you either need to go to college or you need to get out of here, um, and get a real job. And, and so, so to me, I thought I had a real job. I thought I had it made in the shade and I was living the dream. Right. Um, so, so what happened was they, so I didn't want to get a quote unquote real job. So I ended up going to college at the local college and always knew I wanted to do computers. And then basically one day when I was going to my assembler course, because I went to Northern Illinois University and they teach assembler and COBOL there. I think they still do to this day. And I was going to my assembler course. I was so late for class and my, my math teacher, I don't know if he liked me or not, but he I was always unprepared. He always told me, Stephen, if you're going to come to my class unprepared, I'd rather you not even show up. And in my head, I was hearing that as I was showing up to class, what I felt like was 20 minutes late, right? And I don't recall what it was, but I was like, if you're unprepared, why even show up? So I was like, I'm not going to show up. So what I did instead was I went down to the basement of the computer science building and I started working on something that I had heard about and in classes was what they called the master the mainframe contest. It's now known as IBM Z Explore. And I was like, I'll give this a go and just see how it is. And this is kind of where my story, I think, gets a little more interesting. Most people are probably asleep by now. But um, there was three, there were three phases of this contest. The first phase you got, uh, you got a prize for by just completing it. And the second phase was really about accuracy and making sure you did well. And then the third phase was this huge long phase that took a significant uh, time investment. So I only invested the little bit of time I had while I missed class. So what I effectively did was I, I re recognized what the, pro what the prizes were for this, this thing. And the first one was like a hundred dollar gift card and a t-shirt and you got to put your resume in a database. This was all IBM run. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I need to get a job. So I need to get into this. And the second one was, um, I think it was like, a, I think it was some kind of some kind of TV or something like that. And then the grand prize was you get to go to, I, uh, to Poughkeepsie and, and tour IBM and, you know, a lot of fanfare and all that fun stuff. So me being the uh, know-it-all college kid was like, you know what? I really want that $100 gift card. I want to get my name in this resume database. But at the time, I was like, I don't want to go to what I called at the time Poughkeepsie, New York. I was like, I don't even know where that is. I don't know why I would ever want to be there. I knew nothing about it all. So I only did the first two parts. And then I was like, well, that's good enough. I got my T-shirt. I got my $100 gift card. I got my, you know, whatever. And I was like, I'm going to stop there. And, and so I did. I, I thought I knew everything, obviously, like most college kids do. And I never thought anything of it. And then eventually... Somebody finds my phone number, probably from this resume database from IBM, and they call me up and they say, hey, we have a job in, in Poughkeepsie, New York. We'd love for you to come work for us. And I'm like, OK, I think that this I thought it was a scam. So I was like, hey, yeah, can you send me an email about this and I'll talk to you later? And, and I thought they were just trying to harvest like my social security number or something crazy like that. So I effectively just put off this person from IBM and just said, oh, yeah, send me an email. So sure enough, this person, very persistent, sent me an email. And I was unsure if it was real still. I thought someone was spoofing an email or something. So basically, I went to a friend and I was like, I think I'm getting scammed here. I'm not 100% sure what's happening. And they're like, just don't give them any information. It might be real. So I called this person up from the number in the email. And I said, hey, I'm really interested in this. And, and I didn't realize that it was just kind of a, we'll give you the job type experience. It wasn't like, hey, we're interviewing you for the job. So the next thing I know, I had tried throughout my master plan here to avoid Poughkeepsie, New York. I ended up moving from Illinois to Poughkeepsie, New York and working at IBM at the engineering system test lab for, for several years. And I was afraid of flying. I'll be a little bit vulnerable here. Afraid of flying. So what I ended up doing was getting in contact with LinkedIn was kind of flourishing. Um, someone contacted me from a private company in Chicago and said, hey, 
We see you like the mainframe. We see that you have some experience. We'd love to have you come work in Chicago. So I was spending all my vacations driving to and from Illinois and Poughkeepsie, New York. And I was like, this is a no brainer. They're going to pay me more. I'm going to do the same job and I'll be close to family. So why wouldn't I just move? So I did. I packed up all my stuff, moved back to Illinois, worked for a private company, got a huge breadth of experience at this other company, learning everything there is to know about about kicks, about ZOS, and about you know as much DB2 as I could. I'm not a DB2 expert. Um, just a real awesome experience for me. Got to even do some hardware stuff. And it kind of scratched that infrastructure itch that I always had as a kid, building networks and and plugging things together. And I guess I just had that foundational element of computing that was what I kind of would call at this point was kind of old school. I was really into like twisting bits and swizzling bites and all that fun stuff. That isn't what I attribute to to different things like high level languages or high level computing, if you will. So I'm kind of got positioned perfectly to become this translation layer between late tenure mainframers and new tenure mainframers. I don't really consider myself new tenure anymore now that I've been doing it for a decade and a half. So I feel like I can talk to the to the people who've been doing it for quite some time, and I can talk to the people who haven't been doing it much at all. And kind of translate between the two. So it kind of, I think that's my value proposition as, as somebody kind of wedged in the middle. There's not a whole lot of us. We're like unicorns, right? There's, there's probably like three or four of us floating around. I'd hope there's more, but, but it's, it's, just been, it's just been such an enjoyable ride for me. And I think that I kind of echo Vince's story in saying that like coming up into it really just is, is the part of the whole thing that, that becomes enjoyable for you. You know, I, I hope that wasn't a too long winded story, but I tried to abbreviate it a little bit, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, with those intros, I feel like I have the imposter syndrome now. And the only reason I'm on the call is because I have gray hair. Uh -oh. Right. And that's it. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, so, <laughs> um, no, so, you know, going back to my story, when I when I tell people about joining a mainframe software startup, I find myself on a Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on the sidelines on a soccer game, watching my kids explaining to someone, you know, my age, 40s to 50 years old, what is a mainframe, right? If I mention cloud, they're like, oh yeah, AWS, Google, get all that stuff, right? But I find myself like trying to do a little bit of like shock and awe. Like, did you realize that on your way here, when you went to Starbucks, you used a mainframe for your credit card, right? And so what I like to ask my guests, right, is, do you have do you have a great story of the impact the mainframe has today, right? Because everybody thinks about cloud and how amazing cloud is and the scalability of it and, and everything else. But when I tell people that every time they buy a flight, every time they travel, right, and they go on that trip with, with an airline, they're using the mainframe, right? And so we'll start with you, Stephen, first, but... Is there a is there a a story about the mainframe about how it represents its scale and its importance in our economy or society or from a technology standpoint that someone who's kind of fairly new to mainframe wouldn't wouldn't know? Yeah, I I think that that's that's always an interesting question, at least to me, because I get it a lot. Same as you, you know, I'm, you know, when you say startup, everyone gets it. They're like, I know what a startup is. And I'm not definitely not at a, at a startup right now. But like, and when you say mainframe or cloud, everyone kind of gets it because they've been inundated with the information. They kind of at least have a sense of what that means. But when you say mainframe, people are like, didn't that kind of disappear back when, you know, they stopped making movies about hacking? And, and you're like, you're like, no, it didn't. It absolutely did not. Let me explain it to you. And you always kind of revert to that old wheel that we turn where we say, you know, that if you use your credit card today or if you went to the doctor in the last thousand years or or if you did anything with the government, you've used a mainframe. I can, you know, throw a dart at a wall and say you've likely used a mainframe at some point in the last 48 hours to, to most people. Right. And I, I kind of as somebody who who works on this stuff all the time, I kind of don't like those stories um, because I think we try to impress people all too much. You know what I mean? As mainframers, we're always trying to say, we got this really beefy machine and it's so amazing. And and I just like to let the kind of technology speak for itself. And, and you can illustrate to people that, yeah, you've touched a mainframe and you've used it because there are these, these critical pieces of infrastructure 
but but my story is really about now I'm starting to twist it towards um <clears throat> processing power and sustainability and 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 the ability to to kind of scale workloads and I was actually just doing a, a a coding challenge I'm not the greatest developer as I used to be just the other day and it was it was basically just a python challenge I was writing code in python and python runs on zos which is kind of the environment that I work in most and basically what I found is I was building this massive array because I was doing it as poorly as possible. And it's just a bunch of bunch of digits kind of plugged together in memory. And when I was running it on my laptop, it just wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't happen at all. Right. But I have an LPAR that I was plugging it into and that's a ZOS system. Um, and, and it actually was able to churn through it and do the work there. And that to me is really more what I'm interested in talking about when I tell people about mainframes. I'm like, yeah, you have a computer at home. Yeah, there's servers and there's all these 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 fancy little bits about that. But if we have this this idea of yeah, you've used a mainframe, understand how long it takes to to process a single credit card transaction. Understand how that data has to have integrity from end to end, and then understand what would happen if it didn't work. I say like imagine if you pulled up your phone and you were looking at your bank balance and it was it was one either wrong or two, just wasn't available to you. And I was like, that is where the value out of mainframes comes into play, is that it's going to be there. Because I don't know how often I check my bank balance, more often now that it's the holiday season than I would like to. Um, but like, if there was a time that I popped it up and it was didn't match what I thought was in my head, or it was just downright incorrect, I wouldn't even know where to begin. And I imagine most people my generation wouldn't even know where to begin. Whereas someone else would be like, oh, you just phone up the bank and fix this problem. But we wouldn't do that. We just sit there and, and maybe just maybe try to text somebody or something like that. But I think that like data integrity and the amount of processing that happens we is, is really the story that I try to tell more so than like, you use this, you just don't understand that. It's It's not the greatest story, but I think that I think it resonates more with people because I kind of geek out on this is how long it takes to process something. Now imagine doing that billions of times a day and, and imagine what kind of computer could do that, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Vince, where are some of the stories that uh, jumped to mind for you? Yeah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to second what uh, something that uh, Steve said back in my earlier career, one of the roles I had, I was the uh, technical liaison with IBM. And every so often they would trot us up to that very office in Poughkeepsie that you were describing. And they would kind of disclose to all of the big software vendors, here's what we're doing in the next, you know, end months, new hardware, new software, new capabilities, all of that. And I would, you know, dutifully take all of that information, write up a uh, you know, little kind of newsletter kind of thing. And sometimes I do the road show around uh, CA at the time, just talk about, hey, here's what's coming. But what I found over the years is that it's really hard to get your head around the scale. You know, when we were talking, you know, 10 MIPS, 100 MIPS, 1,000 MIPS, 160,000 MIPS, what does that mean to anyone today, right? Unless you've kind of been down in the trenches and you've thought about, you know, this transaction I'm trying to code requires, you know, X. And so that 100,000 MIPS gives me a billion transactions a day or, you know, in, unless you go into it at that level, it's not all that meaningful to folks. But I think those, you know, if I just look at the problems of scale that customers solve, it's it's really um, it's really impressive. One of the things I worked on earlier in in my career was a project we did with the um, U.S. Postal Service, and you know this goes back a number of years. But the the point is, this was the time when UPS and FedEx were first starting to do package tracking, and you know it became a competitive issue. So the good folks at the post office come up with this idea that they're not just going to make you check a box when you mail a letter. They're going to literally track every piece of mail that goes through their system on the theory that you could go back after the fact and say, show me the tracking for this that I never asked for before. 
So, you know, relatively small mainframe data center, you know, a couple of databases to track it all, a little bit of network infrastructure to make sure it was fault tolerant and secure and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And they solved which just sounds like an insurmountable problem. You're, you're dealing with literally billions of pieces of mail a day, and you're going to track it every time it passes through somebody's hands. I mean, it was just, you know, mind boggling to me. And, you know, there are many examples like that. I mean, one of my other favorites, I, I remember working with the um, U.S. government, uh, you know, they wanted a system that, you know, single system that could track uh, everyone that entered or left the U.S., and uh, everywhere they went, sort of in between, if you were a foreign national. So sure enough, they go off and build this. And, you know, we we did kind of a postmortem with them. And again, this is a number of years ago now. But I remember, um, I remember looking at some of the performance data, and they were talking about a million transactions per second, which was just unheard of in the day. Uh, I mean, that's hard to do today. And, you know, could I, could, if you asked me to build something like that in the cloud, of course we could do that in the cloud today, but these are relatively common scale problems that we see in, in, in the mainframe world. And we, you know, as Steve said, and, you know, you said market, we take that sort of for granted. It's out there happening in the background, you know, you swipe your credit card and magic happens, a uh, product shows up on your doorstep the next day or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but it's it it's a real testament to the uh, to the software to the hardware to the platform that allows all of this, and you know it it's it's easy to overlook that if you're not kind of right there in the in the, in the middle of it. It's unfortunate. I mean, one of the things I find so compelling about Steve is he's a new generation. I mean, as an industry we screwed this up royally, right? I mean, we created such a stable platform and such a scalable platform that it never occurred to us that we needed to train a whole new generation behind us. So what happened is the new generation went off to, you know, new things, cloud and, you know, all these other platforms. And yeah, you, you find that, uh, you know, a lot of the mainframe folks have the attitude of, hey, what about me? <laughs> so, you know, it's great to see that there is kind of that, you know, uh, bridge from, you know, old timers like me to kind of the next generation. I think that's, uh, that says great things for the future of the mainframe. I think that we all have probably, probably been in that position where people have asked, like, why do people not get into mainframes? And I think for me, and, and you kind of sparked this this thought in me, Vince, and I appreciate it. And one, well, first off, your examples blew mine out of the water. I love that. The male example is just a killer example. I'm going to steal that one from you. Uh, but but this idea of like, why aren't people in the mainframe more often? And I always tell people, well, like, how often do you mess with your car if it just works forever? They're like, oh, you put gas in every once in a blue and you, you know, get an oil change or whatever. But by and large, as long as it continues to work, you don't touch it. Why bother? Why mess with a good thing? And I think that we've kind of cursed ourselves as an industry, like you said, by making something that doesn't fail. I was reading an article the other day. I don't have any citations on this, but they were talking about, I think it was like an airline booking system, something that was, that was a mainframe driven system. And they're like, this thing's just buried underground. It's like they have some way to access it and meddle with it. But by and large, this thing just goes, you know what I mean? It's obviously not it's just covered in soil, but like they <laughs> it's just put in a data center that's like in a mountain somewhere and it just functions. And they're like, this thing is the heart and blood of all travel. And imagine if it just didn't work one day, you know what I mean? And I think that that somebody and I don't know if this is even a, a real thing, but but it's an interesting example to kind of noodle on is there's this idea that if if all the cloud systems that we have, you know, and I don't like this us versus them mentality, so I apologize for the anecdote here, but it's if the cloud systems just vanish, you snapped your finger and they kind of disappeared, life would be relatively uncomfortable, right? Like I couldn't use Instagram. I probably couldn't use my Starbucks app or whatever it is. But by and large, I could still go to an ATM. I could fetch some money and I could go to, you know, like 7-Eleven and buy a soda or whatever, right? But if all the mainframe systems, you snapped your finger and left all the cloud stuff and you snapped your finger and you made all the mainframe systems disappear, they're like, well, the economy would just grind to a halt, 
like, where do you go from there? You can't even get your money anymore. And, and now it would just be complete chaos. And that's the story that I try to tell people, but because I think it kind of speaks to the critical infrastructure nature of what we work on and why it's important. Yeah. I, and, and to elaborate just on that, um, there was a client we had when I was back at Accenture that had put out an RFP for support for their credit card payment processing system. And, you know, that one of the bullets in there was the relevance of the importance of this application. And it processed $7 trillion worth of payments and transactions on a daily basis. Right? I mean, that's just that's unbelievable, right? If you, not even the number of transactions, obviously there's a ton of transactions that add up to $7 trillion, but the importance of, you know, the monetary, you know, importance of that is extremely important, right? And, and to your guys' point, right? I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people have forgotten about it. And those that start to learn about the mainframe, they often jump to this idea, we got to modernize, we got to get off this, thing, right? And, you know, to, to quote an old colleague of mine, Jeff Emerson, he came up with this phrase, the mainframe is dead, long live the mainframe, right? And, and you know, you guys have probably experienced this quite a bit over the years where someone says, I'm getting off the mainframe and I'm going to do it immediately, but there's still so many mainframes around, the number of MIPS are growing, right? IBM's still developing new mainframes, new processors, you know, bringing Python to ZOS, right, to attract new talent and those types of things. I mean, what are your thoughts on, you know, that a modernization journey for a lot of our clients, right? I mean, there might be some where they're on a very small mainframe that does one specific task and that might be an easy target, but the ones that are using it at scale, um, you know, what, what does a modernization journey look like to you? Often it's get off, but that's not always the case, right? I mean, terms, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think, um, boy, I'm trying to remember the first time I remember hearing something about the death of the mainframe. It probably was like, I remember a Gartner report from about 1992 talking about the mainframe only has five years left or something like that. So, you know, it's, it's not a new uh, phenomenon. I think it's kind of that, uh, you know, what's changed is that a lot of the uh, executive leadership in a lot of organizations don't have mainframe experience anymore. So they find themselves in the role of, you know, let's say a CIO or, you know, some senior position and they're dealing with things they don't necessarily understand. They know it's expensive, right? They know probably the biggest check they write every year is to IBM. Number two might be to Broadcom or you know, one of the software vendors there. Uh, and you know they don't really understand it. They don't have a lot of people either. In a lot of cases, there is one mainframe staff for maybe 10 to 20 non-mainframe staff in that technical organization. So it kind of builds towards what you're describing. Yeah, you know, the natural thing is to, you know, maybe not fear what you don't know, but kind of just assume that there's got to be a better way. And you look to, uh, you know, all the hype out there and, you know, there are plenty of vendors that want to help you move, uh, you know, and, and that's really, um, that's where I think a lot of the motivation comes from. But I think... There is still a lot, you know, especially in those sites that are very dependent on on mainframes today. I think, you know, if you sit down and you have a rational discussion about what's the cost, what's the risk, what's the benefit, and you kind of weigh all of those things together, you'll usually find that um, there are better things to do than worry about decommissioning your mainframe. You know, most organizations have competitive pressure, they have, you know, all sorts of new markets they want to tackle, all types of things that they need to focus on and get done. And compared to that, moving from one platform to another, you know, if it goes perfectly well, you end up with just what you used to have, but you might have spent millions and millions of dollars to get there. So, yeah, it's it's a hard thing to uh, to to kind of get past that analysis unless there's some, you know, driving force behind it. Still, it's, you know, funny little anecdote. I used to do um, uh, kind of invited guest lecturer stuff with uh, uh, one of the universities in, in New York. 
And, you know, so once a semester or so a couple of times a semester, I'd come in, kind of give an industry perspective on computing. And, you know, these were in kind of wet behind the ears undergrads. These were masters and PhD students. And, you know, one of the things I used to do is every time I would go in front of a big group and often there were a couple hundred in the, in the audience, I'd ask, you know, show of hands, how many of you have ever seen or heard of mainframe computing? And over the probably four or five years that I did this, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of people who had admitted to mainframe expertise. So there's this huge disconnect between, you know, as we've been talking, it's such a central and important thing. It's a wonderful platform in terms of capability and, you know, all, all the other things we've said. But yet it's out of sight, out of mind. And it really doesn't, uh, you know, you know that, that idea of migrating gets to be a self-fulfilling prophecy just because people aren't really, you may be making those decisions in the way they might have, you know, 10, 20 years ago where the staffing was different and, you know, all these equations were different. So, yeah, I, I mean, look, it's going to happen at a certain number of sites. I agree. You know, there are a lot of folks I, I remember recently coming across, uh, mainframe site. The only reason they had the mainframe was because there was some regulatory reason that they had to be able to rerun some numbers that they had computed seven years ago. So they kept a mainframe quote, just in case, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it would be hard for me to justify that from a business point of view. Uh, yeah. So, you know, those kind of cases, absolutely. Those folks, they probably honestly should have been gone a long time ago. The airlines, the big banks, the government agencies, I mean, that's a totally different story. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's, I mean, great, great, great thoughts and a lot to think about, right? I mean, the skill aspect of it and why it becomes an easy target, right? Is, uh, it's great points around that for sure. And, and Steven, I mean, in Sona, you guys are hosting some of the largest mainframes, right? In, in the world, right? And. I'm sure your clients are coming to you and saying, look, you guys understand our environment. Is there a way to modernize, right? And I, I'm curious how, you know, those conversations go or your thoughts on, you know, some of those modernization journeys. Yeah. So, so I think, I think that when you first asked the question, my initial thought was, was, was really like modernization is one of those dicey terms, right? It's one of those things that people don't really agree on, but it's an industry term. So we kind of have to live with it. Um, so when I first joined in Sono and this was, was had to have been, it was only three years ago, I joined up with them. My title was mainframe modernization engineer. And we quickly learned that, that, that kind of put a bad taste in a number of mouths. Um, and that people didn't really understand if my role, this was kind of an internal conversation, whether if my role was to help people get away from the mainframe or if it was to help them make, make better use of the mainframe, right? And that's kind of how I define modernization. So we quickly transitioned from calling me a modernization engineer to an innovation engineer because it wasn't about taking people away from the mainframe because the mainframe was like, oh, this, this, this dude's going to kind of ruin our livelihood. He's going to try to get people off. And I was not in the business of migrating workloads away from the mainframe because I'm a mainframer kind of through and through. My whole professional life has been has been doing mainframe stuff. I've always wanted to kind of bring capabilities that I've loved and enjoyed about non-mainframe platforms to the mainframe and kind of bring that that intuitive and practical ex experience, user experience that you get as a system administrator on non-mainframe platforms to the mainframe platform so that we can bring people in. Um, but, but our conversations around innovation, uh, I'm sorry, quote, quote unquote, modernization, uh, really kind of swirls around, well, what do you want to do with the mainframe? And I don't recall if it was you, Mark, or Vince um, that had mentioned that, that sometimes if you just kind of have that thing frittered away in the corner and all it does is like one task and you know that that task can actually be done somewhere else, it makes sense. We'll have conversations with, with customers and I don't have a ton of conversations with customers. They don't want me talking to customers and that's okay. Um, but like, is is what are you trying to do? If, if, if you're just having it process a few things every once in a blue and it's just expensive to you and it's kind of this albatross, then we'll help you kind of quote unquote modernize to get that workload somewhere else. 
that makes perfect sense. You know, we take kind of that that measured and meticulous approach of well, what do we do with the data? What are our retention things that we have to actually do with that data? Where can we put that so you still have access to it to meet some of those requirements that you had mentioned, Vince? Like, oh, we got to process a record that we took like seven years ago. Well, let's put it somewhere so that we can kind of get at it, but we might have to create something to get at it again. Um, so we'll we'll have those conversations. But the conversations that I love the most about it, about modernization, and I kind of always don't like using that term, but um, it, it basically is a conversation about we have this mainframe, we're, we're hearing all these really cool things, we have this cloud infrastructure, or we have this non-mainframe infrastructure, whatever that might be, we want to have those two platforms start to talk to each other. So to me, modernization tends in those conversations to become not how do we how do we modernize to move away from something that we see as as stagnant and stale but how do we modernize our our thinking around the platform so that we're no longer seeing it as just this you know monolith that sits there and and keeps our critical infrastructure just kind of going but how do we access it and do really fantastic amazing things with it and so so those conversations are are extremely fun for me to have because now you're suddenly talking to people about capabilities they never knew even existed and mark you you said you know because i we're talking about python on zos right i can't tell you how many people i've talked to just technicians in the mainframe world who didn't even know that that was possible what setting aside anyone's feelings about python as a programming language and and talking strictly about just the ability to start processing records on the mainframe to quickly whip something together and prove that something can be done, that just inspires so many people. So those conversations are literally the reason I wake up. I just love to have those kind of conversations with other people. And I was actually earlier today having a conversation with someone who was processing a bunch of records that they had created through a SaaS program using Python. And they're like, is this even possible? I'm like, heck yeah, it's possible. Let's do this. We sit down, we have a working session with it. And they're like, I'm getting the hang of this. I can't believe how fast I'm whipping this together. And they're using new tools and they're just, it's changed their whole workflow. And it's really kind of, what I like most about it is that it, it reignites the passion somebody had. Maybe that was 25 years ago. Maybe it was 30 years ago for a platform they fell in love with when computing to them meant infinite possibilities suddenly they're seeing it all over again through a different lens and, and they're falling in love with it. And that is what we need is more people that are remembering why they got into computing in the first place, maybe through a whole new set of tools, maybe through a whole new set of languages, a whole new set of capabilities. We as an industry have to not just focus on people like me or the new generation coming behind me, but how do we reignite the passion of those late tenure people? We bring them back into the fold get them really excited about computing once again. And that to me is the beauty of, of modernization. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and, and I agree with you, right? And modernization, I mean, the default is, hey, let's get this thing off of its current platform, do something brand new, whether it's mainframe or I guess for Hunter or something else, right? I mean, everybody's just, we got to get to the cloud and that's modernization. But I think you bring up a really good point, right? And I've always been, you know, someone that's saying, you know, I believe that mainframe modernization includes in-place modernization as well as, um, you know, maybe off the mainframe. And I think when I think about virtual Z events and what you've created from a product standpoint, it goes to Stephen's point about having the mainframe participate better, if you will, with external systems, applications not running on the mainframe. And we do that through modernizing data access on the mainframe. So maybe you want to spend a couple of minutes talking about how we accomplish that. Yeah, no, and to your point, it's um, it's interesting to me, many of the conversations we have with customers, this point will come up that that's exactly how you would do it on, you know, let's say a Windows server or a Linux server. What we've really done is bring many of those same options to the mainframe customer. So, you know, I want to use... I don't know, storage in the Amazon cloud. Great. I can do that. Uh, you know, Windows customer might not think twice about doing that. A mainframe customer has really struggled with that kind of stuff in the, in the last decade or so. 
So, you know, to a good extent, that's what we've done is level the playing field. You know, the options that you would have on other platforms are suddenly open to you on, uh, on, on ZOS. So, yeah, I mean, our, our approach is, you know, and, and look, let's face it. I mean, it's all about the right tool for the right reason. You know, there, were, there was a period of time, I thought this was actually pretty funny many years ago when we started to see, you know, open source kinds of things ported to the mainframe. I remember a group uh, figured out how to run what amounted to a graphical Linux desktop on a ZOS machine. It was probably an OS 390 machine in those days. But, you know, I, I, I mean, it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense to use mainframe MIPS to move a mouse pointer around a screen, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's the wrong tool for, for, for that kind of a use case. Same is true today. I mean, mainframe is great at scale, security, you know, cost at that enormous scale. You want to leverage that. And that's exactly what we do with Virtual Z. If you have, you know, mission critical data sitting on your mainframe, we make it drop dead simple to access that data wherever you are. Could be in the cloud, could be, you know, a, a non mainframe server 20 feet away from the mainframe. Uh, you know, the opposite is true too, though. If you have data in the cloud and you need it in a mainframe application, I mean, my goodness, think of what some sites do. I mean, and I'm sure Steve's done some of this. You know, you, you write Python or, you know, some type of scripts to extract that data. You transform it in a way that the mainframe can understand it. You put it in a mainframe. I mean, that is so costly and so inefficient from, uh, you know, skills point of view, uh, you know, we basically say, do the same thing you would do on any other platform, just point to that storage and consume it in your application. So it's kind of a different world. And, uh, you know, I think um, once customers get their heads around what we're talking about, this idea that I don't have to be, you know, chained to a particular platform because that's where my data is, is uh, suddenly kind of a really empowering idea. So, uh, I mean, certainly early days for us, but I think that um, this idea of get to anything, anywhere you want, if your preference is to keep data on the mainframe, do that. Your data is in the cloud, makes more sense to you, do that. And if you want some of each, that's fine too. You know, do the right things for the right reasons, and uh, you know everyone will be happy here. So, uh, you know, that's our that's been our approach, and you know, I I think it's something that I've learned over the years is that you know an awful lot of uh, software vendors tend to be pretty rigid. You know, do here's my way of doing it, and you know, as long as you fit in that box, maybe you'll be happy with that. Our approach is more. There are a lot of good answers out there. There are a lot of different requirements depending what problem you're trying to solve. We want to give you as much flexibility as we can. So, you know, we open the door to uh, to all of that. So, yeah, I mean, a different world in that regard. And I think that, you know, as, as Stephen pointed out, one of the things that does is it makes the mainframe a little more approachable to developers who maybe don't have mainframe skills. You know, if I'm, you know, I think of it sometimes, you know, suppose I'm an application developer on, you know, coding in Java, writing, you know, let's say Linux server applications that run in the cloud. And somebody says, I've got this cool information that I need you to do something with. It just happens to be on the mainframe. I mean, that's, that's like the look of terror when you hear that. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, sign me up for root canal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 So, uh, so, you know, we can go to him and say, look, the things you know how to do work against mainframe data too. And I think that that message gets to really resonate in a, in a world where that kind of thing has been so hard to do and has resulted in the mainframe being isolated and kind of locked away from, you know, some of these other, other users out there. And and I, I think that's true modernization, Vince, to be honest with you. You know, you're democratizing access to data, and it really is this come-as-you-are approach. What you know, you don't have to throw it in the bin in order to work with the mainframe. Suddenly, just 
do what you always do. It's, it's intuitive to how you, your current work flows. And the next thing you know, you're accessing data that you know has integrity, you know is secure, and you know that you can actually use it in a way that, that resonates with you. I don't care if you're using Python. I don't care if you're using Java. The only exception I have to anything that you said was that you called me out for creating a, a house of cards. And you're 100% right, Vince. And that's the why I have an exception with it is because I've built those house of cards infrastructure to make data accessible off platform. And you know that tons of people build these things because the thing is, is that we're engineers. Someone comes to us with a problem. We come to them with a solution. Is that well, solution, and what choice is there? Right. right? And, and is, is that solution maintainable over time? I've told people a number of times if you take one of my house of cards solutions to access data on the mainframe from a non mainframe platform and you hand it to some other engineer, they're going to like, this guy had no idea what he was doing. Let's throw this in the bin. And that's why I would say, like, out of the box solutions are extremely profound because of reference architecture. Because you have a document that says this is how this is implemented, and it just works. So that when when Stephen Perva disappears from the planet, you can hand that to somebody else, and they say, "Oh, this is how this works." Okay, I can actually maintain and use this, and that's a really really compelling point to to not basically creating your own do it yourself data massaging tool or whatever you want to call it, um, and and that's incredible. Yeah. Well, and and one of the little side effects of that is, you know, if you're building kind of bespoke standalone applications, you're probably under a lot of constraints to get it done, to have it work, all of that. You probably don't have a lot of flexibility to make it truly optimal, you know, to really get deep into it. And, you know, how do I get every last bit of performance out of this file transfer or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with a uh, out of the box solution, you know, we know that in our case, that's life and death for us. You know, we know that if we are perceived as slow or clumsy in any way, then, um, you know, customers aren't going to be happy with that. So it's much easier for us to solve that because we can put the resources into it, knowing that that solution is going to be used over and over and over again. And, you know, just to drive home the point, you know, we, we published a, a demo recently that showed um, some mainframe vSAM data uh, ultimately going into a Tableau report. Uh, you know, it, it can, and I'm sure you've been there, right? It's I've got a file that's a mix of character data and floating point numbers and all these mainframe data formats. And I'm trying to get them into a tool that runs either in the cloud or on somebody's desktop. Uh, with our solution, we are able to do the whole thing, including filming the demo of it in about an hour. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's ultimately about the productivity there too. And, you know, customers will talk about, well, I've got this mountain of stuff that I've deployed already. How do I justify going back and kind of rethinking some of that? And the answer is all about, well, just think of the risk, think of the productivity, think about you know, the life cycle of some of this stuff that has to keep up with change over time. That's where the enormous costs tend to be. And they're not obvious costs unless you're, um, unless you're really into it. Mm -hmm. The, the one thing I'll add, um, and I think you both kind of touched on this, what's so interesting about the approach that we've, that Vince has taken with Virtual Z's products is there's this mindset that you got to be very careful about MIPS and you touched on performance, right? How expensive is this going to be to run and, and everything else? And I think a lot of the common tools that are out there today that have kind of been forced fit or developed as a house of cards or whatever you want to call it, they take that into consideration at the end, right? Well, almost when it's too late. And we have so many conversations with people where they're super nervous that whatever we're going to deploy on their mainframe is going to cost them a ton more money. It's going to dramatically increase their MIPS because they told us they just went through a process and it dramatically increased their MIPS, right? And I think by using the mainframe to modernize mainframe, right, and using the core components that Vince is able to get access to and, and, and the tools he, and, and, you know, the, his abilities to understand the mainframe at any, at, at the level he does really benefits us and differentiates that product, right? Our products. So. 
Yeah. I mean, the one thing I'll say is, th is thank you, Stephen, very much for joining. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I mean, your perspective, your stories, and and every anecdotes and everything were fantastic. So thank you so much uh, for the level of detail and and insights you provided. And Vince, as always, um, I continually to learn from you every single day. But, um, more than I ever thought I would, but uh, oh, no. I, that's what I love. <laughs> that's what I love. So <laughs> that's a reflection of me, not you. <laughs> this has been an absolute pleasure. I honestly appreciate y'all having me on. It's been fun. I always, I always, this is the second time Vince and I have got together to chat and, and no surprise that, that we've spent more time than, than planned. He's just so incredible to kind of be, to kind of be in the shadow and, and yeah, praise to you for that Vince thank oh. you thanks for having me on I seriously appreciate it yeah absolutely Steve. thank you so much all right thanks guys and yeah thanks to both of you for uh, doing this it's been a great uh, great session and uh, hopefully our viewers will think that too